Hey, welcome to Discovery once again. Welcome to our online audience as well joining us today. We're in part four of a five-part series that we have titled As Long As We Both Shall Live. And that's that kind of wedding terminology a lot of you have heard. You probably heard that in your wedding or you may have heard the more traditional till death do us part um, as long as you both shall live. And it's this idea of marriage that it's really supposed to be something that's happy or and forever, it's this, it's this idea of marriage that is, is really God's design. So we've been asking this question all throughout this series, you guys. Are great marriages possible? Like, really, is, that, is it possible to get, like, God's design, really, in our culture today? Because, really, when you look at it, and we've been talking about the statistics, really, it's a 50-50 chance of making marriage successful, um, ending in, in 50% of them ending in, in divorce. Uh, are really, is there really a, a, a plan or a way that we can have a great marriage? And the answer, we believe, is yes, absolutely. Like, God does have a way. God does have a plan. Um, but it's just not likely or probable that you will have a great marriage. Because even the ones that end, the 50% that end, the 50% that are still going, they're not necessarily thriving. They're not great. Some, a lot of them are surviving. They're in survival mode. They're on life support. Um, so really, the world's way and culture's way, it's just... Great marriages are possible if done God's way. Let me say it that way. Really, what our theme verse is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We want our marriages to really look like this. It's traditionally the love chapter of the Bible. You know, a kind of marriage, a love that never gives up, that never loses faith, that's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So in this series and in this time of the, really the year, we're, we're investing in our marriages and in these relationships, one of the most important relationships we have on this earth our marriages and for those of us that are single we're actually preparing you for your future marriage that we would be a blessing to you like you can actually learn some tools and things to go into marriage with now in order to do this in order to have this kind of marriage we're making and keeping five commitments in order to have this kind of marriage we're making and keeping these five commitments and i've been giving to you every week so I'm going to quiz you, okay? We're going to, I'm, usually I have you say them at the end, but you're going to say them at the beginning, which is why, by the way, you need one of these. <laughs> these. If you guys don't have one of these sermon note binders, they're free. They're at the information center. Go grab these. You can like go back to your sermon notes and, and study them. That's why we hole punch these things. We want you to not just hear the word here, but study the word of God as well. All right, week number one, we're going to make the first commitment to do what? God. Seek God. Man, I'm telling you, this one I hear, this one is the game changer right here all these are archived you can go back and listen to them online you guys to seek god the statistic on marriages change drastically when you seek god together notice it doesn't say like go to church because church going is not something that changes the the statistics at all it's it's when we are actively seeking god together will change the statistics dramatically. And we gave some really practical tips and tools on how you together can seek God, man. And you'll change the statistics on this for sure. The second commitment was we're going to, we're going to fight fair, right? We're all going to fight. We're going to fight in marriage. And I throw punches like this. Hopefully you ain't throwing punches in marriage, all right? If you do, fill out a card or something. We'll, we'll help you out, Okay. But, but, uh, but we, what we're going to fight, right? There's going to be conflict. There's going to be stuff going, but it doesn't have to be so detrimental. It doesn't have to be so dysfunctional. It doesn't have to have the collateral damage that it has. You know, there's a way we can fight fair. We can actually have constructive, uh, constructive conflict in our life. And if you want your marriage to be that kind of, as long as you both shall live, you need to learn how to fight fair. And so that's what we talked about. The word of God is so rich in wisdom on how to do that and handle conflict. That was part two. The third commitment that we need to make is the commitment to do what? So I heard the guys louder on that one. Yeah. Have fun. We're going to have fun, man. And so check that message out. It's more than just, you know, that type of fun, man, but it's got to be more than that, but you got to make a commitment. You have to make, include fun and enjoyment and a commitment to that because it's so easily overlooked, man. We went over that just last week, this week, the fourth commitment we're going to make is the commitment to stay pure, to stay pure, which can I just say, if you are, um, new to church, 
you're new to Christianity, maybe you're just kind of investigating this thing, and or maybe you think there's some things about God's word and stuff that's archaic, um, that may, may be like religion that doesn't make sense to our culture today. Can I just encourage you to do something um, with me, for me, just for the next half hour? Can you just like let down the guard just a little bit, okay? And really look objectively at this topic with us, with me. I mean, we're going we're gonna to look at it objectively and see not only what God says, but see the results of, of, of not making a commitment to stay pure and what, that, what the effects are, okay? So if, if you do me a favor, just for the next 30 minutes, just take that guard down. I mean, I am for you. God is for you. I love you. But we're going to say some hard truths today. Okay? Amen, everybody? Amen. Okay, here's the last. We're going next week, this final one. We're going to end with the last commitment, which is to never give up. Man, we're going to never give up. And even if you're, listen, if you're, I'm not naive, all right? Some, I know that some are on their second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever marriage that you're on right now. What I'm, what I'm challenging you to do is like, like today, like from now, as long as we both shall live, like make a new commitment, make these your commitments today. Okay. So today we're in stay pure. How do we do that? There's this beautiful, um, purity, uh, one of the best purity verses about marriage is Hebrews chapter, um, 13 verse four. Let me start there. It says marriage should be honored by all. And what he means by that when he says honored by all, he means um, according to God's, how God defines it. That's how you honor marriage. I honor it according to how God defines it. Honored by all. And the marriage bed be kept what? Be kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Now, do me a favor all across. Let's kind of play along with you guys. I want you to raise your hands if you're, if you're married. But before you, you got married, before you were married, you always dreamed of one day committing adultery on your spouse. Anyone? Anyone? No? No one? Okay. All right. Okay. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. If when you were a kid, you had always dreamed of one day being addicted to pornography. Anyone? No, 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 no one raises their hands, right? Because no one sets out as a goal to actually, you know, oh, it's my dream in life to actually be bound up by this sexual sin or to ruin my marriage or ruin my family with this. But listen, the statistics say that over 90% of Americans believe that adultery is always wrong, always wrong. Yet in this time that we are living in, we're committing adultery more than ever in our history. What's happening here? Why the, why the difference? Why the variance from what we believe and know to what we're actually living and doing? The University of California study said that over one third of marriages in over one third of them, one or both of them admit to committing adultery. Twenty two percent of men say they've done it. Fourteen percent of women say they've done it. So let's ask this question. I mean, we ask our great marriage is possible. But today I'd like to ask this question. Why is impurity increasing? Why is impurity increasing when over 90% of us know it's wrong and always wrong? Why then? There's, there's probably a lot of reasons, but let me give you three very important ones that are worth talking about today. Here's number one. Take some notes with me today, you guys. The first reason why impurity is increasing is that more tem- there are more temptations today than in the past. Isn't that true, you guys? I mean, I'm sure you've noticed that. That it's just, there's... So many more ways and even easier ways to get into a lot of trouble, isn't there? I mean, we're in the age of social media. You got Facebook and Insta and Snap and all these other things, man. And you are introduced to relationships you would have never been introduced to before. And avenues of relationship. I can't tell you how many... You know, people fall into this trap of of entertaining things on social media platforms. It's just... It's just easy. I think one of the most groundbreaking things that changed the game in this area of just temptation increasing is uh, the, the invention of smartphones and iPads and stuff like that. How many of you lived here? You grew up as a kid and you didn't have smartphones. Okay, so you know, what I, a lot of you know what I'm talking about, that when you were younger, if you wanted to like, like even look at pornography or get some pornography, you had to know a friend who had their dad and he had a stash somewhere in his house, right? And you had to go find that. Or he knew where it was at or he had older brothers or something like that. That's what, that's what you need to do. But now it is, they have even websites dedicated to committing adultery privately. There was even this thing on Craigslist that Craigslist had, you can get, you can get a, 
a screwdriver, you can get a new computer, and you get a prostitute. That's what you get. It's, it's ridiculous. It's just so available now in our country. It's just, it's just the temptations have increased. Ephesians chapter 5 says, But among you, there must not even be a what? Not even a hint, he says, of sexual immorality. The reason why is because he says, look, this, you don't play with this. This, there, this is so divisive. This is so, just so manipulative. It, 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 you are created with body, soul, and spirit. Triune. I'm not going to get into this study right now, but you need to know that this is an area where the enemy can, can drop some seeds in and cause so much harm and hurt and wounds that can affect the totality of your, of your creation, of your body, of your soul, and of your spirit. So he says, don't even, you, not even a hint of sexual immorality. So why is it increasing more temptation? Another reason, people are getting married later. They're just getting married later in life. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting married later. A lot of people in our culture are choosing to wait longer. There's no, like, biblical time, like, oh, this is, this is when you should, you should get married. There's no biblical time for it, but getting married later changes the dynamics a little bit. It does. Because in our culture, I'm not saying it's God's, it's not God's standard, but in our culture, when you wait to get married longer, what that means is you just have more dating partners. And again, it's not God's word. It's not God's standard, but let's just be honest and real. What does that mean? If you have more dating partners, it means you're having more aggressive cuddling. You know what I'm talking about? Because one thing leads to another. It starts, oh, I love you so much. My sugar muffin, pumpkin pie. Like you just, you're the, you're the, you're the only one in my life. Which, no, they weren't. They're the 17th. You just, but you're the only one for me today. And, and one thing leads to another. And you know what? When, why don't you just stay over my place? And, and you're over here so much. Why don't you just, I got a toothbrush for you. And you know what? I, why don't you just take this drawer? Take this drawer right here. You can have a drawer. Just, you know what? I got an idea. Let's just save some money and... Move on in together. I mean, that's just, why don't, why don't we just, why don't we just do that? And you wonder why it's so hard when you break up. Why it's so painful when you break up. Because you're doing married things and you're not married. You're just pretending to be married and you're not. And that's why it hurts so bad. So, so then when the right person comes along, you meet that right person and you, you do get married. And then what happens, because it is challenging marriage, you're going to go through this season. When it gets tough, what do you do? You walk out. Because you didn't know it, you've been training for a divorce your whole life. Our society is training people how to be unfaithful. Because you've done it 17 times. You have did marry things and you walked out when it got tough. In fact, the statistics say that the way that people break up in the, in the whole dating game, the number one way is when one cheats on the other. So what, what, what's, going, what's going on here? You guys, people are getting married later. It just increases the dynamics. That's just, that's just the truth of it there. First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. That word just means set apart for God. See what happens when you, when you come to Christ, you give your life to Him, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and He just rearranges inside out, redecorates your soul. And He continues that you should avoid... Sexual immorality, that's the same word of Ephesians just before. That word sexual immorality, I highlighted it. That word uh, in the Greek is pornea. Pornea, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's where we get the word porn or pornography, but it means so much more. It does mean that. It means pornography, and, 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 but it also means adultery. It means sex before marriage. It means homosexuality and, and a host of other things, a host of other things, you guys. This is, this is, uh, he says, it's a, it's, it, this thing is so divisive, unlike a lot of things. Each of you should learn, I, I like that word, learn, to control his own body. You know, you can learn how to do this. You, you learned through, through the pattern of culture and what was been taught. To, we've learned how to be uh, lustful, how to be uncontrolled, how to just, how to just fall in line. You, we've learned it, and you can learn how to control this. Like, God can help you bring this part of your life into alignment that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God for God did not call us to be impure. He called us to stay pure, to live a holy life. And if you're not married yet, you don't build a life of purity on a foundation of sin. 
Amen, Pastor. That was good preaching. I, mean, I need some response just a little bit. I know it's tough today, but, but let me, let me, let me kind of say this way. The, the best way to prepare for a pure marriage tomorrow is by living a pure life today. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not just going to happen when you get married. No, no, no. You need to cultivate that. You need to cultivate that in your life. Why are relationships so messed up right now? Well, there's more temptations. People are getting married later. That changes a lot of things. Number three, there's just a growing sense of entitlement. Would you agree? There's just a growing sense of entitlement because if I'm not, if I'm not getting it from my spouse, then I'm justified in getting my satisfaction elsewhere. I mean, if she's not going to meet my needs, then I'm a man, aren't I? I'm, a, I'm justified then at looking at this stuff to meet my needs. And, and if he's not meeting my emotional needs, then I'm, I'm justified at going to lunch with my coworker who's going to meet my emotional needs because because my god wants me happy and i deserve it i deserve to be happy and we have this growing sense of entitlement in our culture first corinthians chapter six says this though flee from from he says from sexual immorality like run 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 forest run get out of there You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You see, God cares about your body. And and he created your body. He created your body to have passion and desire. He he created that. Go watch last week. He made that stuff. And and, and your passion is like a fire, right? It is. And and you, you you can't just like, you can't play with fire. You can't light the fire anywhere. I mean, you got to you fight like you want to light a fire. You got to use like a fire pit or a fireplace. That's where you light a fire. You light, you try and light a fire anywhere you want, like in your living room. You're going to burn the carpet, right? You're going to burn the couch. You're going to burn the house down. All right. The, the, there is there. Your fire needs, write this down. Your passions need parameters. Passions need parameters. Parameters. You see, passion isn't the problem. Your parameters are. That's that's the problem. The passion isn't. The passion was. And again, like I've been telling you all throughout this series, God God's way isn't just right. It's better. I'm telling you, the fire is better when it's in the fireplace. A culture will tell you, just let it burn, baby. Light it here, light it there, light it there. Just go, go, go. You you do that. Keep on doing it. You're gonna burn your house down. You're gonna burn your house down. I'm telling you, God's way is better. You need you need some parameters around your passion, and it's not limiting you. It is it is protecting you. It is making this part of your life what always God intended. And I promise you, is better. Is better. It, it is just better. Your passions need parameters. Galatians chapter five, verse twenty four says, "Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross." And crucified them there. Man, I no longer live. I am crucified with Christ. Let's do this. Let's talk. Let's talk about purity, you guys. We got to make a commitment to stay pure in our relationship. So what I want to do is give you four ways. There are four things that will give you some parameters around your purity life. Because purity matters. And again, none of us signed up for adultery. None of us signed up to be... uh, bound by the addiction of pornography yet some statistics say 70 percent of americans are in fact did you know that over 33 percent of all the internet is porn all the internet it is a multi-billion dollar industry and we need some parameters we need some godly parameters around this you guys so the fire doesn't burn the house down here, take some notes from me. Here's, here's the first parameter I'm going to give you. This is God's word. If, if you want to, as long as we both shall live, stay pure. Here's number one. Make a commitment to God's standards. That's got to be where we start. We just got to come back to this, you guys. And I'm calling us back to make a commitment to the word of God. You see, God's word is going to say some things that um, conflict with culture. God's word is going to say some things that, that maybe, you know, even conflict with your own passions and your own desires. He's going to say some things that are un, unpopular. But the question is, what are you going to do at that point? Are you going to follow culture or are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to bow down to culture or are you going to bow down to Christ? 
And it's at that point, at that point, right there, at that fork in the road, determines whether he's your God or not. You see, he's not your God if he can't say some things that culture doesn't like or you don't even like and you don't submit to it. He's not your God. He's, he is your God when you say, you know what, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand that, God. But you're God, so I'll submit. I, I, will, I will surrender. I'm going to bring myself under that because you are God. And listen, he is the only one that has exclusive rights to say what are the parameters in this area of your life. He's the only one. No one else has the right to say that. I mean, just look at the decay and the destruction of marriages and relationship and what lust in this area of our life is doing to our lives and culture. Just look at it. At some point, you guys, we got to come back to the manufacturer's specifications. To the design of this thing, like God created it. And if we were just to operate, submit to, bring it under his design, I'm telling you, it's better. Sometimes, like, I even get asked, uh, like, what do I think about certain things? Because this is a hot topic. Sexuality and stuff is a hot topic in our culture. Not too long ago, a young guy asked me, hey, what do you think about this, Pastor? What do you, what's your opinion about this? And I told him, I don't have one. I don't have an opinion about it. God does. I just use his opinion. In fact, I would just say to a lot of you, stop having so many opinions about stuff. Just stop. Stop posting your opinion on Facebook and coming on Facebook about this opinion and come and arguing about this. Just stop having opinions. God said it. Submit under it. That's it. That's it. So it doesn't matter what my opinion is. It doesn't matter what you're if you are a child of God, if you've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and your passions and desires are hanging on that cross, your opinion does not matter. I'm sorry. Sorry, I just felt like it was harsh. I'm sorry, but I love you. We got to make a commitment to God's one th- Psalm 139 or Psalm 119. This actually is, I believe, Psalm 110. It might be wrong in the notes here. Psalm 119 and 9. It actually tells us how, if you're young, how can you, how can you do this? Because it's hard. It is. How can a young man keep his way pure? Only one way. By making a commitment to God's word. Making a commitment. I got to make it. And I call you to that church that as long as you both shall live in your marriage, the first part, that first parameter, I'm following God's way. Okay, God, you're right. Hey, church, God's right. And he's not just right. He's better. He's better, you guys. Psalm, uh, no, here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. First one, make commitment to God's standard. Second thing, the second parameter is to manage my mind. Manage my mind. Because all impurity, all, all sexual impurity especially, <laughs> begins in the mind. Now, it, it enters through the gate of your ears or your eyes. Like, what are you looking at? What are you listening to? But it will manifest itself in your mind, in your, in your thought life. There, I'll say it this way. There is no such thing as a one night stand. No, you were thinking about that two weeks ago. You were thinking about that a month ago. You see what you, you saw something, you heard something, and then it started germinating in your mind. You started meditating on it. And, then, and, and so that you may have acted on it one day, but that thing took a month for you. You just didn't manage your mind at some point, uh, you know, it entered the eyes of the ears. Job says this in Job 31. He says, I made a covenant with what? With my eyes. I've, I've made a pact, an agreement with my eyes. And I'm not going to look at any lustfully at any impure girl. I'm not going ha- to look lustfully at any impure thing. But it's so hard, Pastor. I know. I know. It's, it's in our culture. It's everywhere. It's, it's, if you are going to be victorious in this area, if you're going to survive the onslaught, the day after day onslaught in our culture, you're going to have to, please listen, you're going to have to start feeding on healthy food, not the dog food you keep looking at or the dog food you keep listening to. And you wonder why you, oh, I keep making the same mistake. I keep, oh, I did it again. No wonder. Look what you're looking at. Look what you're listening to. You have to manage the faculty of your mind, which includes the gates that it comes in, your eyes and your ears. Manage your mind. Psalm 101 says, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. No vile thing. I'm going to do it proactively, not reactively. 
Every, listen, you got every one of us, it takes years. It takes, takes years to build a healthy marriage. This kind of marriage we're talking about that we all aspire to. It takes a long time. I mean, it just doesn't happen, this process of becoming one. It is. It's a process. You got to work at this thing. You got to make these commitments and work them out. It takes, it takes years to build a healthy, as long as we both shall live, marriage. But it takes one moment to destroy that marriage. Just one, just one bad decision. Just one to, to, to destroy your family, one to ruin your career, one to ruin your calling. Hey, it just, I always say you're just one step away from stupid. All right? Just one, I'm serious, just one step, every one of us. Which leads to the third thing. Here's the third thing I want you to do, and that is to magnify the consequences. We got to magnify the consequences. It, it, which is not what a lot of us do. See, see, many of us, what we do is we magnify the satisfaction and the fulfillment. We magnify what satisfaction we're going to, and we minimize the consequences. And what I'm saying is we need to reverse that, you guys. That needs to be reversed. This is a parameter, you guys. We need, we're magnifying the wrong thing. We need to magnify the consequences. And the only reason why I give you this even as a parameter is because the Bible does. Okay, Proverbs chapter 5, 6, and 7, the whole, those whole three chapters, all, all it is is discussing and explaining to you what's going to happen to your life if you say yes to the wrong things. At, at one, at one of them actually says that you will ruin your life. If you go down that path, you'll ruin it. Proverbs chapter six, 32, just one of them. You should read. I'm telling you, Proverbs chapter six. If you're a guy in here, you should read that every month. Every month you should read just as a protective uh, mechanism. Proverbs chapter six, 32 says, but a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. I mean, he just wasn't thinking right. Man, he just wasn't thinking. He lacks judgment. Whoever does so destroys himself. He's just walking off the cliff. And what, and what many people do with this analogy of the cliff is we're magnifying the fulfillment of that thing. We're magnifying the enjoyment. So we're seeing how close we can get to the cliff going, oh man, if I, ooh, that would be nice. And, and, and we just jump right off this cliff. What I'm saying is turn it around, magnify these, these consequences. All right? And, and what I do even is I'll rehearse some things even in my mind. Of what that, what that would mean, man. And what that would mean to my marriage. What that would mean to my wife. How I would cause such detriment and hurt and pain. Could even lose it that I'd have to go before my kids and tell my kids, your dad messed up. I'd have to stand before you, this church, and say, oh my, hey, I, I, met, I would lose it all. And some of you are thinking like, man, Pastor Jason must have some issues with this. And it's like, no, that's not at all. It's, it's, I don't want it to become an issue. So I'm, it's a protective mechanism to magnify the consequences. If you think that you too, you are too far above this, then you're probably too close to the edge already. You got to magnify, step away from that thing and magnify the consequences, magnify them. Your passions aren't the problem. Parameters are, that's the problem. Everyone has passion. Everyone has fire. Just not everyone has the right parameters. Okay? Here's the fourth one I'll give you. And that is to maintain proper relationships. Maintain proper relationships. See, I've got to nurture the good ones. And I have to, I have to get away from, maybe even sever the bad ones, the toxic ones. And the most, if you're married, the most important relationship you've got to nurture is that of your wife. See, if I didn't love my wife deeply like I do, I'd probably have to remind myself a lot not to commit adultery. But I've just found out that it's so much easier to, to, to just, to not go, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Don't look at that. Bad. No, bad, Jason. No, don't do it. No, I found it just so much easier to just fall deeply in love with my wife that I don't even want the substitutes. I don't want that stuff. I don't think about that stuff because I am in love with my wife. You got to maintain proper Relationships, and not just with your spouse. Spouse, you need to have some other Christ-honoring relationships in your life as well. And this is where small groups here at Discovery come in. You got to be connected to a small group church if you're serious. If you want these five commitments here, and you want a, as long as you both shall live kind of marriage, then you need some people in your life. Both of you do that. That know you. That really know you. And I'm not. And honestly, if this is an area of your life that you struggle, if there's a stronghold in your life, 
of a sexual nature or, or a stronghold of some pornography or addiction or even homosexuality. We have groups for that. We have freedom groups and celebrate recovery groups. And this is included, this stronghold. And you would do yourself a favor if you just stepped into that environment, took off the mask a little bit and said, hey, I need, I need, I need some accountability in this area. Instead of just letting your house burn right before your eyes, just because you were too prideful to say, I need some help. And not just not, I mean, Celebrate Recovery is more of a direct accountability. We have a lot of different small groups that they're not necessarily accountability groups. But, but what we what my hope is, honestly, there's a lot of different studies. But what my hope is, is that you would get connected to a group and just build some relationships, make some friends. And that over time that you'd have enough trust with someone that you can actually say, hey, this is really what's going on. This is really what I'm dealing with. You don't have to do it with everybody, but with somebody. Somebody needs to know. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful and it's wicked. That I can't even trust myself. But you can't fool people that you've let in deep enough to know what's really going on. And I, guys, and I want you, I want you to have, have, I don't know about you, but I don't want to just play church. I don't want to just, just play church, get my feels on in the weekend and act like it you know, doesn't matter for the rest of my life. I want God in my life. I want God. I want, I want to, I, and I don't want to just start strong. I want to finish strong and honor him. And I want you to as well. You need Christ honoring relationships. You need it. Why? Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise. But a, conf- a companion of fools suffers harm. Now, I don't know what you're thinking right now. I know this was just really like, bam, kind of hit you with it. You're probably having one of three different responses right now. And I've been praying for you this entire series since we began this. I knew where we were going because this is, and I can feel the weight because this is, this is a real topic that, that, that many are facing right now. And you probably have one of three different responses. And I, wanna, I want you to write them down with me. One response you may be feeling right now is defensiveness. You may be going like, uh-uh, it's not that bad, Pastor. I mean, I can handle it. I can deal with it. It's not that big a deal. I can see a little bit of skin. I got my own filters on. It's a, no, no, no. No, you can't. Let's get real. No, you can't. No. Oh, but you don't understand, Pastor. I love them. We're in love and we're going to get married one day. One day we're going to get married. It's just, oh, you don't know our circumstances and this and that. Can I just can I tell you, look, I love you. I want what's best for you. I'm not trying to be rude and get all up in your business. Neither is God. God loves you. He wants the best for your life and for your future that it can be as long as you both shall live. It can. If you do it God's way. And honestly, that's uh, that straight up. Hey, that's rebellion defensiveness. And I was in the store the other day and I saw this Time magazine, The Science of, of Marriage. And, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to get that, read through that and see. And it was actually pretty cool. They had this one article, Nine Signs Your Marriage Will Last. And the first um, sign, the first one they get, number one, that you dated for a while, but you had your own place. She didn't cohabitate. And I find it's just, it's just so interesting that like years ago, years ago, they were saying, oh, no, no, this is the way you got to do it, right? Don't you remember like years ago, this is the way you got to do it. This is, see, but now that we got some time between us and they're looking at the stats now, the world isn't going, oh my, no, actually, no, this is not good. We're actually, you're just getting trained for divorce. You get it, that's all that is, it's training for un, unfaithfulness. You know why? Because God's way works. It was true then, it's true now. It'll be always true. Maybe you're just feeling a little bit of defensiveness and pushing back a little bit. Or maybe the second response you may be feeling is, is some remorse. You know, a topic like this that you, you could be thinking like, like, oh, man, you're right, Pastor. I'm so jacked up. I'm so dirty. I'm so sinful. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so nasty. I'm just, I'm, a, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm helpless. I'll never get through this. I am hopeless. And can I tell you that is a lie of the enemy. He wants you to feel that. He wants you to get stuck and stay right there in your shame. You see, there, there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. There's a huge difference. The enemy uses condemnation. God will use conviction. Huge difference. See, condemnation goes like this. The enemy will tell you things like that. You're dirty. You're nasty. 
you're a sinner. You know, and, and it, like if they knew, oh, if people knew, if people knew the real you and what you really go, what you really did. Oh, and, and, and he wants you to stay right there. That's condemnation. Conviction. God shines his light on it. And he says, hey, yep, there's some sin. Yeah, you got a little you got a little stain on you, but you could be clean again. Yeah, I, I'm glad you recognize that. I see that. Here's some light on it. Yep, there's some sin there. But I can set you free. Here's the way out. You see, that's the difference of, of conviction and condemnation. Condemnation wants you to stay there and be buried underneath it. The conviction of God. Now, he doesn't point it out to you to make, to make you feel terrible. No, no, he, he wants to shine light on it so that you can be free. So that you can step out of that. Which leads to the third response, which is the correct response. And that is repentance. Now, don't, don't start wrestling just because you got that last feeling. Let me kind of, let's give me a few moments to explain this. What repentance means. It, it, in the Greek, it's metanoia. And what that means, it's so beautiful. It just means, okay, God, you're right. I agree with you. It literally means to change your mind and come into agreement with God. Isn't that beautiful? Like, like God is asking that you would just come into agreement with him. Like you can be clean again. You can be free again. You can. Metanoia, repent. God, I'm going to change my mind. You're right, God. Heal me. Forgive me. I'm following your way. Now watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Godly sorrow brings. You're right, God. Oh, you're right. It brings repentance that leads to your whole life changing for the good. It leads to salvation and leaves no regret. You see, there will never be a time in your life where you will regret this decision, where you will ever go, oh man, I shouldn't have gave my life to Jesus. Man, I wish I wouldn't have got clean from this. I wish I wouldn't have got forgiveness for my sins. Ah, dang it. I messed up there. I was duped. No, you'll never regret this. But worldly sorrow, remorse, it brings death. You see, if you feel it and you sense it, like you're sensing it right now, but you don't respond to it, the Bible says you'll die right there if you don't respond to it. Come on, let's bow our heads all across this worship center. I want to give you an opportunity today to respond to God's voice, to his spirit leading and guiding you right now. Because some of you may be here and, and, and maybe just feeling a little bit defensive, maybe maybe pushing back a little bit, or maybe even a little remorse where where you feel that, you feel the weight of it, and you feel the lies of the enemy trying to keep you caught in it right there. But today, God would just ask you to change your mind, to come into agreement with him. And that just not only is agreement, listen, that's not just agreement. We're saying, yes, I have sin. It's also agreement that, that what God thinks about you. See, God doesn't see you as a sinner. God sees you as a son. God sees you as his daughter. You are his creation and he loves you no matter what. The enemy wouldn't want you to believe that. But today, you need to come into agreement with God. He loves you. And he gave his life for you. The Bible says that if we confess our mouth with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. It doesn't matter what you've done, like you'll be saved. And maybe you're here today and maybe you've, you've sensed this before, like you've sensed God moving in your life like this, but you've never really responded to it with surrender, with submitting yourself under it and saying, okay, God, I'm coming to agreement with you. You're right. Or maybe you've done it before and you just kind of walked away from it. You need to do it again. Today, I want to pray for you. I, just, I want to pray a prayer of surrender, a prayer of salvation. And today, we just respond to his word, respond to the spirit of God and how he's leading you. Come under and say, God, forgive me, save me. I want to do that right where you're seated. Now, I'm not going to have you come up to the front or stand up or anything like that. I'm not going to single you out. But I want to pray this prayer for you, with you, right there. If that's you, whether it's the first time or you need to just come back to God today, will you be bold and lift up your hand and lift it high? Say, Pastor, will you pray for me? Come on, yes, yes, yes. Leave it up, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen, amen. Leave it up, leave it up. Yes, yes, yes. Praise God in the back, yep. Yep, back there, yep. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put your hands down. Pray this prayer. Say, God, forgive me of my sin. 
I, I recognize it. I see it. And I, I want to take your way out. I'm changing my mind. I'm coming into agreement with you. I repent. Forgive me of my sins. Come live inside of me, Jesus. And redecorate. Sanctify. Set apart. Like change me, Jesus. From the inside out. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for cleansing me. Setting me free. God, I pray for every marriage right now. That they would make a commitment today to stay pure. That they make a commitment today, right now, to your standard, God. To your word. God, we're just going to submit under it. Your word said it, we believe it. To manage our mind. To start putting filters and protection and parameters, God. Help us to magnify the consequences. Not just the, the satisfaction. God, and help us to maintain healthy, God-honoring relationships. And if you're single today, that one begins with God. God, help me to maintain God-honoring relationships. That as long as we both shall live, we commit to stay pure in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, if you receive that today, will you give God some praise? Yeah? Amen.